an honor for me to be here. I actually should mention I'm also a York proper grad, if, if you want to put it that way, because I did my honors BA here in English and Poli Sci. And uh, so I've been at York for a long time. And when many of my uh, classmates at Osgoode were trying to find their way around, I was already a veteran by then. So it's a great place to be, and it's so nice to have you here with us today. For me, it means so much to stay connected with our alum. And I, I try and do that in any way I can. And I think this initiative is a wonderful one. And I tip my hat off. Uh, we've already acknowledged you today, but thank you so much for doing this and for having me here. So um, actually, as I speak, speaking about IP, and I have to say, we're competing with stem cells. So I'm very <laughs> delighted that you're in this room. And uh, the catch is that I'll actually mention something about stem cells. So you probably have, you're probably in the better place here, because <laughs> you'll get the IP and the stem cells with me. Um, so I have a team that's competing now. Uh, the Fox Moot is going on, and it's an annual competition. And I've coached this team that it debates a, a, a fact pattern that every year goes on. And so after this, I'm going to head down and say, go Team Osgood. Um, so thank you again for being here. Now, the topic at hand is very much IP. And I guess I wanted to start by really asking you as to um, what you think IP is. So that's how I propose we start off. So that's just sort of um, a sketch of what I'd like to get through today. Of course, I encourage you to ask questions along the way. Don't wait for the end, because it could be that you don't get a point, and then by the, the time, it's sort of a, a domino effect, perhaps. So just feel free to interrupt, put up your hand, and we can chat about it. It's meant to be also a conversation with this circle. Um, so I'd like to first start off, what is IP? Contextualize things, of course. I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't do that. And always give the disclaimer, but I'll call it a caveat today. And provide you with examples, so tangible examples as to how we see IP applied in our daily lives. And then, of course, we have to go towards solutions. Because I'm not one of those academics, and I don't think those exist anymore, actually, that just theorize. Because in today's world, the universities, our faculty members, our students are all about integrating the theory and the practice. So that's sort of what I propose to do. Um, so first, what is IP? Well, how about this? How many of you, I want to see a show of hands, use IP? Oh, OK. So we have 60, 70% using IP in this room. So you put up your hand. Yeah, what, what do you, how do you use IP? Yep. It's intellectual property, there's vices, and I use it. Perfect. We have a sophisticated uh, audience member. So uh, software. Um, Microsoft is one of the hubs of right, yeah. IP. Yes? And it's just at a simpler level. Anytime you read something, it's published. It's like yeah, very good. Anytime you read something, that's using IP. Well, most of paper you present, so there's a word that you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I have presented one. Yeah. Yeah. On lobbying uh, educational institutions. Yeah. Uh, to get uh, degree credit for professional program and finance or fellowship. Okay. So that, exhaustive resources. so that paper is a type of copyright? I would assume so. Yeah. We could get more into to that as well. Anyone else? Yes? I'm just going to go back to your, your definition. Yeah. If, if, if I walk up there and take your water, water bottle and label it, it's pretty obvious I've stolen your physical property. But yes. If I steal your Perfect example. So there's a distinction between the physical ownership and the actual IP, the intellectual ownership. So an, a good example, we've brought up books. Uh, a book, I mean the uh, very um, copy of the book, if you burn that book, the IP still subsists in that book. So it's that the expression of the idea, that's the copyright. So we've talked about using IP. What about owning IP? How many of you are owners of IP? OK, one at the back, a little less. 
So maybe 10, 15%. Okay, so at the back, you put up your hand. What do you? Publish books. You publish books. Perfect. So we have an author in the room, yes? It's, it's about like the Far East tapping into the American uh, corporates and getting all of their research information. And there's no way to get back at them. Okay. So the research information in terms of, but how would you own that in terms? That's the problem that they've got in the States, right? Okay. The big companies cannot protect their information from yes. being hacked into. So, and if you bring it to your own personal life, how would? Anything I put on my computer, anybody can get at. Okay. So we talk about ownership of the IP. Is someone, yes, at the back? If you didn't register, what, what is it that you're, what, what? Systems development, good question. So there, there's, we start to see a distinction f with, between the different types of IP. So copyright, you don't need to do anything, it's automatic. So you would have protection. Yes? I, I deal with, with it on a daily basis in yeah. my job. I work in a, uh, a newsroom, so I'm dealing with video, I'm producing uh, stories all the time. So we have intellectual property yeah. and else, so a lot of places cannot use it without giving us credit. But we also have to be very careful about when we bring stuff material in, like something that's off the internet, uh, YouTube or anything yeah. else, and how it's used. There's, a, there's appropriate ways in which it's used and ways that we can misuse it, in which we usually get nailed with it. And then there's the, the part like where, even with my own personal artwork and everything else, I would retain copyright. I, even though somebody else may, may grab an image of it and try to use it, I would still retain it. I, yeah. As an artist, I'd never give up. So that's very complicated, what you describe, and that's really the digital environment where you have many types of IP, many types of owners of IP. Um, but let me ask you this question. How many of you have written uh, a card before, an email? <laughs> Can I see a show of hands? Okay. So you've written cards to your friends, emails, text messages, right? So guess what? We're all owners of IP. So all of us here in this room have a vested interest in figuring out what is IP and how it really implicates our daily lives. In fact, from when we wake up in the morning and we, you know, our alarm goes off to when we go to a birthday party and sing happy birthday, we have IP involved. Um, so what I'd like to do with you today is to really try and figure out how we see IP playing itself out and really try and understand that because one thing that I see time and time again in leading industries, and we talk, this morning we were all talking about innovation, is that we don't really diagnose the types of rights at play and how those could then mess things up. So in, in a sense, I'd like to rehabilitate the law as your friend here at the Circle of Friends as not so much as a barrier. Um, so why don't we uh, look at some of these questions and my caveat, of course, is that IP on its own is not going to solve everything. And it's not all about IP. So that when we talk about innovation, and you say, is you know, IP slowing innovation, quickening innovation? Is IP good or is it bad? That's really a piece of the puzzle. Of course, we know it's the entire system that is at play. And we, talk, we start seeing this a bit in the examples you give. It's about the regulatory system we have in place, research and development, our tax structures. What else? What other examples do you think? Other systems? Yes? If you're writing a business plan and you present it to a financial institution, it's part of the process of getting a finance. Yes, absolutely. So the whole money side of things, this is aside from the law. So all of these have an implication in addition to, of course, the IP piece. But with you today, I'll be focusing on the IP piece, but the caveat is that there is a whole other larger system at play, and to the extent relevant, we'll interrogate those other systems as well. It's the example I gave. I don't know if you caught the agenda with Steve Pakin a few nights ago. I was actually on it, and the whole question was about innovation. And the example I gave is in the NHL, you know, we've had some troubles with our NHL, um, do we focus just on what the quality of the players or the hockey sticks? I mean, how is just focusing on one part of 
the equation going to solve everything. You have to look at all the pieces together. And it's a whole puzzle that we're trying to solve together. And that also should give you a clue to what we've talked about this morning, too, is that going forward, there's going to be much more collaboration between the disciplines. And what better place to do it than here at York? We are the interdisciplinary university. And that's really how I myself pursue my own research, is to work with teams of experts in other communities. So we know IP plays a pivotal role. It's one role. And one that I, I really believe is seldom understood. So today, it's maybe we'll come out of this session knowing a bit more about where we see IP at place, because we all know that we're all owners of IP, right, at the same time. And these are the things that really keep me awake at night, because <laughs> it's all about IP in my world. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Uh, when I started, so I started here at York in 1992. At the time, really, IP was not uh, a big thing at all. Um, in fact, when I went to law school uh, in 96, so 96 to 99, I was at Osgood. And there, I remember that um, there weren't many course offerings either. In fact, there was one course that was called Intellectual Property. And it was at the time that my professor decided, and he's a smart guy, his name is David Vaver, and he actually then left um, Osgood, went to Oxford, headed that department in IP, and we scooped him back here. So he's now back with us, where he should be. And so it was as in his wisdom to really intuit that this is a growing area. So what he decided to do was to split the IP course in three. And these are the three sister areas. So when we talk about IP, if you think about three sisters. You have copyright, patents, and trademarks. So copyright, those are the expressions of our ideas. And earlier I mentioned you don't have to do anything to have copyright protection. So when you write that card, when you put that email together, you have copyright over that. Now, patents protect inventions. Patents are a bit more complex, and I'll touch a bit more on that. But they protect also the expression in many ways of that invention. So the test is new, useful, and not obvious. I'm not going to drill down to that detail. But if you're interested, we could talk more about that even offline. And what is trademark law? Trademark law is really the branding of those expressions and of those inventions. That's basically it. And then there are related areas. Yes? So isn't there the, the fourth sister of trade secrets? Yes. So you could say it's a fourth sister, a stepsister, or a big sister. Uh, trade secret is closely allied to patents. But the difference is with trade secrets is that while well, patents is all about the disclosure, so to get a patent, you have to disclose what it is that you invented. Trade secret is the opposite. You better shh, not say a word. And you have to have all the systems in place. You have to have a safe and all these real old school things. If you look at the case law, it's all about locking it up and making sure no one finds out what it is. And that's also subject to protection. And the difference with trade secrets is that you don't have to do anything except for really be secretive. And you get protection forever. So it's in perpetuity. So patents is 20 years right now. It started at 14 years. It's crept up a bit. So copyright, life, plus 50 years. I mean, we don't have to go to this level of detail. But this is like, these are the things that you would take. If you were in one of my classes, we would start. OK, uh, you know, building up. But essentially, there are differences between them. Um, the three main ones, and then you have closely affiliated ones, like trade secrets and patents are very much together. So um, what, going back to the courses, you, have, you had the three courses at the time. For me, I, I realized that once I took one of Professor Weber's classes here at Osgood, I had, was infected. I said, this is the area I want to pursue. It was one of his copyright classes. I had taken an English literature degree, and I love the fine arts and writing and reading books. So I thought the perfect marriage is really law plus literature together it equals copyright. And then I always had a curious mind. I loved my biology class. And uh, I did a lot of research, actually. Um, 
on, um, at the time I wrote a paper on new reproductive technologies and I really saw that my curiosity for science was also matched by this field of IP. So it just sort of made sense to gravitate towards this area. But of course at the time, this is still, we're still back in, what, 1996? And I was already starting to think about, okay, what am I gonna do after when I get out of here? Um, and I would say, my friends and family would ask me, so what are you studying, what do you wanna do? I'd say IP. And they would be like, what, what is that? So there was lack of awareness. Some thought it was internet protocols <laughs> that I was interested in. Um, but of course, <laughs> That's changed a lot. In fact, um, even at the time, then when I started practicing in a large Bay Street firm, I wanted to do IP, and there wasn't a lot of it still. I mean, I would see it sort of on the fringes. I would work on an M&A deal, so mergers and acquisitions, and there'd be some clauses there that would talk about the movement of the goods and that, but it wasn't really doing IP for me. Now, of course, you have law firms with departments that have IP departments and in fact they're supporting clients that their really reason of being is their IP. So what are some examples? We talked to, we mentioned Microsoft. This was the year of the Viagra case, right? Big case, that was all of over fighting about the IP. Uh, Facebook, so a lot of my students are on Facebook and there's all different, the spread of social media there. There are different IP implications. So it's everywhere. In some ways, IP has become ubiquitous, but yet there's still this lack of real understanding about it, and that's why I think we need to start having a conversation about it. So the conversation should not be, is IP good or bad, right? It shouldn't be, you know, all about the numbers. We'll leave those, you know, to more the experts to look about the, the accounting over it, the economics over it. But it should be about what is IP, where is it applied, when should it be implicated, and sometimes we need to also overcome IP where we could see that it's a barrier, right? So the, the key for us is to have the mindset ahead of time to diagnose the problem so that we can avoid problems later on. And here, I should say that um, if we fail to understand this, the consequences can be devastating. And I'll give you some examples of where, you know, you think, oh, those lawyers, never mind them, right? Well, guess what? If you had listened to the team that was beside you saying, don't do this or don't do that or do it this way, things could have been avoided. So again, the idea also is IP is part of the law. We need to rehabilitate the law to be a friend with other disciplines. And that's what really IP is also trying to do. So in terms of some of the examples, um, I'd like to take you to the health sector first, if we could. Okay, and here I could tell you a little bit of a story. So I was down in our great discovery district um, here in Toronto. And I met with one of our leading scientists in one of our leading um, hospitals. And he, had, he told me that in a few days, he was to sign this deal close to half a million dollars. And I said, well, what is it about? And he said, well, and he had been working on all these experiments. And he basically was going to give the data, so all of his research, and upload it onto a grid system where there was a, a lab in Japan involved and another one in the UK involved, so that they'd be able to do better science and share information. And you had um, a company involved because they were getting, um, they were being paid to do this. And then I said, okay, well, what about the rights, the IP? He said, what, what a IP, what is that? And again, I started that conversation with him and I, I started to point things out that, well, hang on a second, um, you know these scans that you have, all these mammograms, these MRIs, well, those are artistic works and those are subject to copyright protection. So who owns those? And then I said, did you know all these notations, these scribbles, these, the doctor's notes, your own report? Well, those are literary works. 
also subject to copyright protection. And then I said, and what about all the people involved? What were their, what did their employment contract say? Would, did you consult with them? Are they employees of the hospital? Because we know that if you're an employee, unless there's an agreement stating otherwise, you don't own the IP. But if you were a consultant, then the law says that you should own the IP. So it starts, see it's getting very messy. And then I said, you're putting it onto a grid. There's other countries involved. What about asking all these questions there? Have they looked at this? And then when you put them all together in this grid, who owns all that data? And who has access to it? I had no answers. He had no answers. Um, so, uh, problem. Because a few years earlier, I had actually studied this in the UK, where I went to uh, do my graduate work at Oxford. And there, the example is E-Diamond. So E-Diamond is not about the diamonds that if you were Dean Kaczynski's talk, <laughs> you would have seen those diamonds up there. Um, it actually stands for, um, well, it's a database for mammogram data. So the actual acronym is Digital Mammography National Database. And here, this was a project that started in 2002. And that's kind of what it looks like. So that's sort of trying to simplify it. So eDiamond was this initiative uh, out of the University of Oxford. In green, you see the participating universities. And on the out, outer edges, you have the clinics that were involved, so the hospitals. And then, of course, you had the software companies that were putting this whole system together. So the idea was to have a, a repository which would help cure, treat cancer, breast cancer for women, and to amass data from all of these hospitals, have it uploaded onto this grid, have the universities involved and a whole bunch of students involved to also translate some of this information, and it would then be an e-diamond. Well, the vision was, uh, was a good one. Um, hang on. Okay, so the vision was a good one in that, well, well, the objectives are lofty ones, right? I mean, treating breast cancer and doing this by collaboration was really the way to go. But what we decided to do was to really look at, we had the IP question. So we, we got together with some computer scientists, um, some anthropologists, it was an interdisciplinary team, and we studied what had actually happened, um, how they protected their rights. And so this project was funded to the tune of about five million uh, pounds, and this was in 2002. And there was a whole bunch of uh, press release, even at the time um, the Prime Minister Blair had said something about this, that this is gonna really revolutionize science and using the grid technology is gonna help better diagnose problems, so on and so on. So all of these objectives uh, were gonna be met. So our team went in and we basically had to do a retrospective study. So we canvassed the conversations, the emails, the legal agreements, the lack of legal agreements, and what we ended up finding out was that because of the type of contract that they had in place, so there was an instance of a contract, it turned out that in the end, the e-diamond almost killed itself. It gave itself rights only for the duration of the pilot period. And it didn't say anything about the thereafter. And guess what? The only party that had the wisdom to give themselves rights in the thereafter well, they have an army of lawyers and you know, they're up there. So the software company now has, they still have access to use the data for testing research purposes. But the actual e-diamond no longer has rights. We found out in some cases where nurses 
were heavily involved in the uh, collation of the data, they actually were the owners because they were hired as consultants and without an agreement, because they put in a lot of their time, effort, skill, and judgment, all the tests that would meet copyright protection, because did I mention that the court said anything more than a line drawn with the aid of a ruler is subject to copyright protection? You don't need to be Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci to have copyright protection. So you had nurses and other third parties having rights on this data. Yes? What about patients that their images were subject to yes. copyright Yes. So that's a great question. They did sign off, but they only signed off, they gave their consent. And from a patient's perspective, and th that's actually the one of the governance models forward looking, is uh, that I personally would like to see more patients having more of a say in this whole process. And I'll drive it up to the electronic health record shortly. But patients are actually not owners of those IPs. They have rights akin to that, that are privacy and confidentiality rights. So that's where we start to see a collision of the rights. And that's where, while the patient gives their consent for these purposes, do they th give their consent for a third party to then have access to this data? So what are they consenting to? Yes? Uh, well, related note. If I contract with a, a company in Canada yes. to acquire a credit card and I do transactions, I have the neutrals on suspicious of a transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or India. What are the jurisdictional indications of speaking on confidentiality issues and so to somebody who lives outside? Yeah, amazing question because now, of course, everything is up in the cloud. So our information is being shared in different ways with different entities. So I think it's fair to say that at least the smart ones, legal agreements, Contracts are being written at the speed of light. So when we saw Dean Kaczynski go up, um, they, everything, this is a watershed moment in our times because that example showcases how information and also property that was generated and based here in Canada is now in another country and subject to the laws also of that country. So we're still figuring this out. And it's not, it's not clear. And if you go downtown and talk to the lawyers, they have no answers. Like they're working on it and we're rewriting things the best we can, but it's complicated. But at the very least, it's important that some are attuned to the problem instead of just pretending that there isn't an issue here, because there is. Yes? Mm -hmm. and didn't seem to have a problem. And so he was being studied. His, his blood work, his, all those different things were being taken all the time. And it was being turned into supposedly yes. the doctor's intellectual property without the, the knowledge of yeah. the individual. Has he lost all of his rights? Yeah, so you actually, that's a case that I teach in uh, my property class to first-year law students. It's uh, Moore. The Moore decision is exactly spot on on that. You had um, a patient with pancreatic cancer and would go travel, I don't know how many kilometers, it was just, it's pretty actually, um, uh, when you read the case, you just, you put your hands in your hair. You can't believe that this stuff actually happens, but it happens all the time. And there are laws now in place to address that. And those, that happened, um, you know, a number of years ago where um, doctors actually use your own you know, cells or data to come up with their own inventions. And in the Moore case, they actually patented a cell line. Um, so there's a lot, this, this issue is um, being dealt with. And I think we actually have an appropriate response right now because you have issues of confidentiality at play. However, in terms of ownership rights, the, it's very clear that the patient whose cells were extracted uh, has no ownership rights to that cell line thereafter. So that's something that's clear because for the purposes of the test of what is a patent, um, you just don't meet it. New, useful, and not obvious, you have to be an inventor. The patient is not an inventor. 
Although I've seen many student papers on this, my students are really upset when they read this case and they came out, most of my papers, I give them an option to write a paper, they all write about this issue. So I think we could be doing, we could be more creative because the patient doesn't have ownership rights. But then you also wonder, is it something perverse that the patient would actually commercialize their own you know, cells or body parts that way? So it calls into ethical questions, very profound ones that we also need to think about. Yes? I'm just kind of curious, uh, is the issue about e-health? Yeah. Because uh, I'm a patient in a health studies major here. Yeah. And uh, one of the problems we're looking at is the same thing about the rights and the confidentiality. Yes. Patients across Canada, a lot of it's good they have a lot of reservations because the argument you're making right now about patients not being inventors, yeah. we're all yeah. Cells. You said you studied biology. Uh, cells that reproduce. Yeah. Uh, our purpose is to reproduce. Now, if we're all reproducing, directly or indirectly, we're all we're all agents, and mm. agents are changed. So, in that context, legal students, I mean, uh, you know, patients can make the argument that well, they are cells and they're yeah. agents. So if they have that agency, so that argument can be made in terms of ownership and intellectual property rights. Yeah. How those laws will rise. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, it's, it's a valid one. There, you know, and even if you look at the law, I mean, we could get more into this, but there's certain doctrines like constructive trust where you could find, you know, you could, you could be creative and make the arguments, but so far those arguments have not worked. And I could even, I'll draw your attention, I could provide you with some links to reading further on this, but so far it's pretty clear in the law, the way the law is being interpreted is that you are not owners of your physical owners, of course, of your cells and your body parts, but you're not the intellectual property owners if anything happens to those body parts. Because you have to be an inventor. Yeah? So you're talking about patient consent. Mm -hmm. um, what about, um, I'll, I'll put it in quotes, but informed consent? <clears throat> so if I go for an angiogram, um, I'm under a fair bit of pressure to sign this form right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could argue that that consent is really not as informed as it would be in a typical contract. Yeah, so there's all different types of consent. And I mean, consent also comes up in criminal law. Uh, vitiated consent and implied consent. Uh, so you could make that argument. Uh, then, the, of course, the other side is, you know, you look at the bigger picture. And you'll have researchers advance the argument that we need this information or we need access to this data to advance science. So it's, it's actually quite, and it's not purely a legal question in the end. It also becomes an ethical one and a constitutional one. So there's lots of dimensions to that. But we see these, um, again, this affects our daily lives. You go to the doctor and you even have time retrieving, trouble retrieving your own health record. I mean, I can't even, I had to, I asked my doctor for my health record. She wanted $200 for 20 pages, right? So, and then, you know, and then I said, you really don't want to argue with me. <laughs> so we, but not all of us individually have, you know, that, I guess, volition to even have an argument with your family doctor, right? So, <laughs> but not that I do, frankly. Yes? With reference to whether or not you can have an argument, I yeah. Yeah. It's too costly for me, it's not cost efficient for me to go to a lawyer. Yeah. And one example, I'm not sure I understand it totally, but they want us to give up our copyright yeah. for information that's used in universities in those books that the professors put together. The course packs. Yes, yes. And, you know, it bothers me to think that my work would be used in that way on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think I need my time to write. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not even going to deal with this issue. Yeah. So I'm glad you raised that. That's going to be uh, an upcoming example. We'll talk more about publishing. And I've actually, there's right here, I've written a book on that issue. <laughs> so there's a lot to say on it. I have a case where 
where yep. instead of following the law, mm -hmm. my sister and I had a company a long time ago uh, making you know, purple shampoos and stuff. And we never had, we chose a name, mm -hmm. and we never bothered to trademark it. Because again, it was a, we, we didn't have a lot of money. We right. went through all of the hassle and whatnot. So it's protection on the name. We didn't protect the name. So some time later, mm -hmm. we got a few years later, we got a phone call from some mysterious lawyer yeah. in the States, and it was very vague, that he wanted to, he had represented a client that had sort of a similar product yeah. and wanted to use a similar name, and yeah. they knew they had to pay us off. Yes. So Happens. we found out who it was by checking with a trademark lawyer mm -hmm. who was applying for our name in Canada, and it was Johnson & Johnson, so we figured, okay, we're in the money. We're in the so money. So <laughs> he offered, uh, he says to my sister on the phone, oh, it was worth the pay to come up on the, a plane with a check for $5,000. Yeah, he said, no, thanks. Well, why don't you put two zeros behind it? <laughs> 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 and start talking. And yeah. that's pretty close to where we are. Excellent, now. yeah. Without having a trademark, we had Did you seek any legal advice to get to that double zero figure? Well, we did go to a lawyer. Yeah, to no. Speak, but we even my father and the lawyer were all telling us to take a lot less than what we had Yeah. We just stood our, our, our... Yeah, you have to do that. And even yeah. with authors, so we could go back to this. But there, I mean, trademarks, so patents and trade secrets. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to mention that. So no, it's okay. So patents and trade secrets. Trade secrets, you don't have to do anything. You have trademarks, and this, you know what, trademarks is actually the, I think the most challenging class to teach. Because trademarks, you have, uh, you know when you see that R? That's a registered trademark. So you've actually applied to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, paid some fees and got that done. In your case, you don't have to do anything. You've, you had your common law rights. Common law rights exist because of the common law and all the cases we have that basically say that if you use that mark in that particular area, you're protected. Now, and so there's a difference, though, between the two. I mean, if you want the strongest protection, you want the R because to enforce a trademark across Canada, you need the R. Common law rights are jurisdiction specific, so it depends on where you're in use. We were sold in the States, but had we had the R, yeah. they would have been able to, they, they came up with a name. Yeah. Our name was Natural Affinity. They wanted to call a shampoo Affinity. Well, we discovered really that, because they didn't know about us, yeah. they've done all the packaging, they had the yeah. label for you know, yeah. advertising. Had they known that Affinity was Exactly. They would have exactly. So you were, yeah. So, so you see, there's pros and cons, right, to that. But you know, you had two savvy women that were able to stand up for themselves. That's a good. That's a good scenario. In many other cases, they'll just get railroaded unless you know you're able to advance your position. So you see, at the end, we're all owners. Look, you even have some strong, you had common law rights and trademarks. So um, if we get back to some of this, why don't I just, how are we doing for time? Uh, you were about 35, 40 minutes in. Oh, OK. So why don't I just maybe go through some of the examples, and then we can have more discussion. Because I actually would rather do this, but I don't know if you, if then you're going to feel robbed of some examples that I want, more examples that I wanted to, to talk to you about. So of course, we're, we're still talking about, um, in this presentation, dealing with you know, electronic health records. So I was talking first about the e-diamond, how things got messed up, how I went downtown Toronto and I saw that there was going to be an accident waiting to happen. And then when we look to the EHR here in this country, we know that there's a lot of resources that are being deployed to have you know, our electronic health record, whatever that is, right? Personal, uh, personalized medicine, we have all these different terms for it. Uh, so there's a lot of money being spent. However, in this context, uh, you still see, 
And I was very uh, curious to start reading any materials I could get my hands on. And what are they saying about the ownership question? Who owns what? The governance of our electronic health records. Well, when they uh, reviewed SHA, so that was Smart Systems for Health Agency, and that was based here in Ontario. Uh, that was for a $458 million initiative here in Ontario. Um, and that started in 2006. And that, of course, was reviewed. Uh, Deloitte actually did a report. And they talked about all the things that went wrong with Shaw and why it didn't really meet any of its goals. Not once did even this independent investigation on Shaw mention intellectual property or that they hadn't looked. So they had a list of all the things they never did. They didn't do this, they didn't do that. But even this expert reviewer, this group, didn't highlight, they didn't look at the ownership question. So I thought, oh no, they're not doing it either. I go to conferences, they're talking about the EHR, and there's never a panel, there's never a mention of IP. Oftentimes I want to be polite and I won't you know, put up my hand in the audience because I, I have to name and shame and I, sometimes I say, fine, I'll just talk to the speaker after, he's the minister. <laughs> you know, guess, did you, are you looking at this question? And they'll give you some roundabout answer. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I see this happening a lot and I'm worried. I'm worried because it's our taxpaying dollars at stake, one. And also, it's really our future, more than that. <laughs> it's really the advancement of, of uh, we're trying to do advanced science, research, our health systems, and we want to do it in, in a good way. So that, you know, Shaw folded, then you, you know, had the minister resign over this. I mean, we, we've read all about this in the press. Um, they did another report. You know, 800 million were spent after, you know, poor coordination between the dissolved Shaw and then what became eHealth Ontario, because then Shaw was folded into eHealth Ontario. So how many mil, like you, I'm losing track of the millions of dollars that we're spending on this. Um, so there is a, a bit of a happy story. Uh, York actually has, uh, one of our professors has now a grant to work on this. And I'm hopeful that, you know, his solutions are gonna be much more than, you know, they've been able to do in how many years? Because now the promise is what? Uh, 2015, we're gonna have, that's what the latest is. So eHealth Ontario's new three-year strategic plan de-emphasizes goal of delivering on uh, the EHR by 2015. And they're gonna just be focusing on diabetes. Um, I don't know that, again, there's, the questions are complex. But when you look at the governance structure, there is no excuse why there shouldn't be some type of vision or even a, a, a mission statement. And we, we actually don't have that in place. Um, so my, my curiosity is where this is really gonna end up for us here in Ontario and in Canada. When we're not looking at the governance mechanism. And IP is a slice of it, of course. There's privacy, confidentiality. We've talked about all those. But we need to look at these questions. We can't just, okay, here, we got the money. Let's go. Let's build the system. Let's go. And that's what they all did. E-Diamond did that. The, the, the scientist downtown is doing that. You get all excited. And then what? And then what? So we need to take a pause uh, at some point. But at the same time, it shouldn't get in the way of moving the electronic health record forward. So science and IP. Here, um, I could tell you I've been very lucky uh, having studied here and then at Oxford. Oxford has a college-based system. So that's really where I got my feet wet with the science because I got to, uh, a lot of my closest friends ended up being scientists because of the college-based system that we had there. And that's where I worked with the tech transfer office in Oxford, and I started helping the scientists on their IP. Um, so it was kind of you know, a petri dish for me in terms of what I was doing with my work and seeing it happen. Um, I'm also very fortunate that now I have a partnership with Stanford University in California through one of my grants. And there, you also see students walking around with light bulbs flashing in their eyes that everything is possible. 
So we have, we're able to send some of our students there. So we have this partnership where our students also then infuse, come back and re-energize. And I mean, we've, we've heard this morning from Dean Kaczynski, you know those students are going to have light bulbs flashing in their eyes with someone like him uh, leading them. So you need this energy, uh, you need the hub of innovation. Now, other examples here at uh, York, the Markham Convergence Center, another partnership through one of our programs. I send a student there uh, once a year, and this is through an Osgood initiative where we end up doing a 101, sort of like the basics of IP, and you should see the number of people that come and really converge at the Markham Convergence Center to learn about their IP rights. So that's encouraging. So I mentioned Lasan. Um, we also here have Innovation York. So it's our tech transfer hub, and we work with Mars Innovation Downtown. So another initiative. So you start to see much more of this, especially in the last few years. So what I still see happening, though, is that we have the great talent and we're able to come up with the inventions, but then taking the invention to the commercialization stage is you know, the next big question. And that's hard to do, and I think it really boils down to awareness. So remember, there's lots of pieces to this puzzle, but for the IP purposes, I'd like to just give you some examples of how we might do this better. And this is from my own diagnosis of seeing what happens in labs not only in this university, really across the world, and you'd be surprised, some leading universities, and you know, we've, we, we could talk about MIT, Stanford, Oxford, all of these hubs, Harvard, that have these inventions, and they are able to commercialize, they still have some of these problems. So I'll give you a list of some, some of these examples, and I'd be curious to see what you think. Maybe there's some scientists in the room. So one, I think from an IP perspective, when you look at what happens in universities, especially in labs, the notebook, not the movie, the notebook is key for an, a scientist, so any researcher. From an IP perspective, especially patents, the notebook is revealing of the experiments, the data, when the invention took place. So it's all about the date, right? So notebooks need to be signed and dated. And largely this happens, and it's also based on the institutional policies or that PI, so the principal investigator, the professor enforcing it with his or her students. But what we have now is a situation where most of these notebooks are in paper form. So you have libraries of notebooks, and then you have a quick deadline. You need to find something. How do you do it? So you have all of these books. So one solution, and this is where we need to start thinking about software and digital technology, is that we need to put these notebooks and have them uh, in a digital system where you can actually put in a keyword. That costs money and resources, and I know for a fact there are some labs that are not able to do it because it's very expensive. So then you're at a stage where you have to make the call. Do we do this going forward, or do we actually care about going back and inputting that data into that? notebook database. So that's something that I think we need to be mindful of. And when we think about the deployment of resources, I think that's also a good place to start, is the actual papering and the amassing of the information that our very students uh, do. Then I would say we need to inform them that the tech transfer offices are their friends. So when they think they have an invention or they want to talk about IP, they should go to the tech transfer office. And here, my belief is that we shouldn't be cheap. Because so many times you have people at tech transfer offices, and I'm not even thinking of York here, where these people don't even have any legal background, and they're advising that, yeah, this is a patent, or no, this is not going to work. How can you do that? You, you need to have people that are uh, experts, and they're equipped, and that have been out there, and that can give proper advice, and also have some legal background. So we can't be cheap there. So it's another kind of resource question. So again, it's not just about the IP, but the larger question. Also looking at um, the difference between an inventor and a contributor. And that means that when you see a paper, a lot of these great papers that come out published in 
you know, nature, science, and cell, you have lots of names, right? Well, not all of those names should be on the patent because guess what? That will invalidate the patent. So you have to be truly an inventor that's involved in the conception and the execution of that idea. So there needs to be an understanding also of that distinction, which I still see problems uh, on that point. And then I would say, um, last, thinking about more education, more collaboration between the different schools, and it warms my heart whenever I hear Dean Kaczynski talk because he gets it. He had you know, that, those three bubbles, for those of you that were in his session. You had Schulich, Osgood, and Lassonde. It all comes together through education and more cross-disciplinary work. And there, I would say that you have to understand that the law is an enabler and not a barrier to innovation. Because that's what I think, when we talk about the new generation of engineers as Renaissance engineers, well, there's also Renaissance lawyers out there. <laughs> and Renaissance lawyers want to make sure that there's a floraison in terms of what we can do with you know, our society, starting Ontario, you know, our university, Canada. So enabling more of this to take place. Um, I just want to give an example because I'd like to see this happen, but then when I read things like this, one of my former students. So I should mention, a lot of my students are actually scientists and engineers. Because it seems to be now the pathway after science, they come to law school, and I am grateful for it. So um, one of my students, Tamsin Thomas, this is what she wrote in one of my first year classes. And uh, she wrote a blog post, Perspectives from a Scientist in Training, If I Knew Then What I Know Now. In a strategic plan published in 2006, Ontario's Ministry of Research and Innovation called for the generation of an innovation culture in Ontario, with one goal of increasing the commercialization of research taking place at universities. I could not help but think of my own experience as a grad student in a cell biology research lab. The extent to which universities should be commercializing their research is an interesting issue on its own, but I instead wish to point out the circumstances in which budding scientific researchers are being trained and emphasize that any commercialization of research needs to consider the views, the viewpoints of the grad students who are generating a large proportion of the research. It is essential that grad students are educated regarding their IP rights. So I was really happy to, to see this, and a lot of my own work in fact, I'm, I'm just now organizing a conference on this on March 22. So part, the Circle of Friends is invited to this conference. It's going to be at Osgood, and uh, it's sponsored by uh, IP Osgood, which is something I'll mention um, in a few minutes, and also the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. So we'll be looking at this question. So I really think it starts with the students. And that's where I'd like to mention something about stem cells. I promised I would. So we talk about innovation, and we're all trying to figure out, you know, oh, if you look at the agenda episode, they talk that, you know, we've done it all already. What is there to do? We've caught the low-hanging fruit. Well, I think stem cells is really an area where it's sort of the next frontier. So Dean Kaczynski asked, what is, you know, what do you think the next frontier? I think stem cells. So stem cells were discovered here in Canada in the 1960s. Then we had that big breakthrough in Japan in 2006 with induced pluripotent stem cells. And those was, that study, what that breakthrough really uh, said was that you could reprogram, they took skin cells, reprogram them to go back to a stem cell state, which then could be used, you could have a heart cell becoming a heart, liver cell becoming a liver, and so on. So you could see that there's some great potential here and application to do some great things. So, and this should be something that we keep here in Canada. I mean, we, we were the genesis of this, and we could keep that going. Now, we have to understand the relevance of IP in that, because as we don't want what happened with insulin to happen with stem cells, because although we had insulin here in Canada, then it was commercialized in the US. So patents. IP, the whole system is part of it, and we need to be able to intuit the industry 
and work together to make it happen for us here. I'll give you just a quick example of the creative industries, the publishing industry. Just in a nutshell, what you have here is that new works are being recycled in new media. So, um, sorry, old works are being recycled in new media. So whatever you had in print is now going, you know, it's online, or many things are being born digital. And this problem is not new. So if you think back to even the film industry, in the 1920s, you had silent picture film. When suddenly the sound component, the sound technology was added in, they became talkies. So you had a, really a surge of litigation around the issue. So if you look back to time, even from the onset of the printing press, every time you have a new technology, there are renewed ambiguities and litigation and issues on who owns what rights. So and authors are in the center of it all. And I explored a problem where it's gone viral, literally worldwide. And we've had our own Supreme Court of Canada case here in Canada, the Robertson case, where Robertson, Heather Robertson, sued the Globe and Mail for having taken her works without her permission, consent, notice, or anything, and put them online. Again, this goes back to awareness. The authors, like they don't find out years later when this happens and then they have to sue and they don't have the deep pockets that a lot of the companies we've talked about do. Authors are disenfranchised, especially freelancers, and we know that they are on the rise. OECD statistics point to more and more uh, the nature of future employment is really going to be based on freelancing because no one wants to put someone on a payroll and have to pay for everything, the benefits associated with it. So it's a problem that's not going away. We know that inventions are going to keep happening, so we need to have a system in place to figure this out, and currently I have to say that we don't. So this is another area that you know keeps me up at night, because I care about the authors. We're all authors, too. And so more work needs to be done. The security, cybersecurity industry, well, here, basically, it's the same problem we saw with electronic health records. You see it with all of our data that's you know, being used by different governments and security agencies. And there, I have to tell you, I go to these conferences, they don't want to hear about the IP piece of the puzzle. So again, you have a grid computing technology and who owns what, what can be used for what. So why don't we move towards solutions? And here, I'd like to say that um, maybe if we could just have a recap. I think one thing that we haven't come across <laughs> that I'd like to see more is vision in the governance, more leadership, and capable laws. Again, the law is a piece of the equation. We need to have more crosstalk between the disciplines. We're starting to see this. Well, York is really the hub of that interdisciplinary work. But we also need to work more with the industry, the business community, because they're also part of the problem and the solution. So we need to work together and can't be afraid of that. We need smarter collaboration, and to do this, we need to sit down and really hammer out the vision and the details. And a lot of times, you don't even need legal change. You could actually have some guidelines, the soft law in place. We can learn from other countries. And I think I'm, I love the university. This is the most privileged position for me to be in a university because it keeps you young always, because you're always pushing your, your mind and your brain to think outside of the box. And I think really the university is the hope for the future. And we need to reclaim our universities as that hub um, for our country, that hub of activity. And I've done that with IP Osgood. So I, you know, I don't like to just talk about things. I like to actually do things. So this is a website that uh, I built. And it's actually based on a center um, of, uh, of IP and technology law. I'll actually take you to the dynamic version. So you see here? So this is how you could keep in touch to see this subscribe to the Ipigram. And there, we will send you a newsletter once a week where you will have the latest information on all of our conferences, anything we're doing. And you'll see the Fox Mood I mentioned. That's going on as we speak. Um, you see my lecture is there, too, advertised. Um, so everything that we're, that's going on in IP 
in the community here in uh, York and around the world is actually here. You see here, I have contacts, well, less fortunate from when I was studying in the UK. They send me information, so we're the first to have it here. And you find out um, all the latest that's going on. We actually won a weblog award. So these blogs, most of them are written by our students. I don't believe in having, you know, the professors don't really know it all. We're still, as you can tell, I'm trying to figure it out still. But I want to arm my students with the resources and hone their professional online presence so that they're published authors. So I recruit students to write and I showcase their opinions, which are evidence-based. And not, it's not just about the professor. And we won an award for this. So we also have an exchange program, the placements I talked about. I sent students to Stanford. Um, we're working on a placement to IBM. Sent students to Ottawa, working at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, Heritage, Industry Canada, the Globe and Mail, TV Ontario, on and on and on. So um, that's me. I will, uh, I'll leave you to ensure that you put your name there, because I want you to either put IP as good as your homepage, maybe, <laughs> or subscribe to the Ipigram. And um, there's the actual the date of the conference, March 22. And that's really going to be centering on the student. So it's really, it all at the end of the day comes down to enhancing the learning opportunities and the hope in our students. So I'll end with that, and I thank you very much for your attention and your amazing questions.